Um, moving quickly along, because we are a few minutes behind, um, to introduce our next two panellists, Karen Humphreys and um, Melanie Sorensen, to come forward. Um, while I give a bit of an introduction, I appreciate we're about five to eight minutes behind. So what I'll do as they come up, I'll introduce Karen. Karen is head of the Skills Point for Innovation, Manufacturing, Robotics and Science at TAFE New South Wales. She, come on, you'll be right. <laughs> she is an engineer and teacher and has a practical passion for embedding lean principles into the workplace. Graduating with a Bachelor of Engineering from the University of Auckland in 1989, she migrated to Australia shortly after and started her career working for BHP Research. During her career at BHP, she worked within various manufacturing environments from continuous processing, the steel making, batch processing, um, rectifiers and secondary processes with tubing and wire. In 2001, she completed a Bachelor Diploma of Education from the University of Newcastle and embarked on a teaching career within TAFE New South Wales. She has worked as both a teacher and a leader and is focused on creating opportunity and pathways into STEM jobs through vocational education. Karen has over 25 years experience in manufacturing engineering and education and now heads up an area which is enabling industry and TAFE to come together to design training and looking forward to the future. She knows that this will only occur through strong partnerships and collaborations with individuals and companies that are also seeking to reform with innovation within the manufacturing sector. So again, I'm just conscious of the time, I'm here to come forward and give her presentation and we can follow on with the program. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, so Karen Humphreys, TAFE New South Wales. So I was asked to talk about um, how as a training organisation we're responding to the Industry 4.0 challenge. I'm taking a little bit of liberty in saying how, how are we actually just meeting the challenge full stop. Um, and that's because uh, not only industry is um, in manufacturing is um, being disrupted by digital technologies, so is education. Um, think about the last time you learnt something, and I bet it was through this. Yep, I think my experience was hummus recipes, um, just, just to find that. And it can be changing a tyre or whatever else. So we as an organisation know that um, manufacturing is facing a lot of challenges and so are we. So we knew it was time to change ourselves. So we have a one TAFE, New South Wales Modernisation Programme, and that brings 12 different TAFE New South Wales RTOs to one. And a lot of people look surprised there because they go, I never knew you were 12, Karen. We were one. But we weren't, we were 12 competing different RTOs, which did cause problems for industry, because what they might have experienced down the Illawarra was a little different from what they might have experienced in the North Coast. So we're doing that in order to streamline, collaborate internally, and provide the best of what we do across the whole of the state. So we're the same as all other organisations, we can't make changes and then sit still. Um, so we need to create that environment where we're going to be agile and we can uh, meet the needs of organisations. So we try and put our customer first. We're also recognising collaboration and everyone's been talking about it. I think if I summed up today's meeting, it would be collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Um, and, and we understand that the need to do that. And I'm here today not as an expert, but as someone who wanted to collaborate with IBSA for this conference to say yes, I don't know either, join the club, let's put it out there and let's collaborate and talk about it. So what are we doing? Well, we're actually just upgrading our current qualifications and that's that continuous improvement. We're slowly trying to add skills where we see them and drop off skills where they're no longer needed and just through that fluidity trying to meet the market in that way. Also looking at um, 
upskilling. And we just had a question about skill sets. And absolutely, yes, we're pushing in and totally recognising that skill sets are needed. So we're offering skill sets where we can. There are issues around funding that we can talk about later on. But absolutely, we, we know that we need specific skill sets. We're also encouraging students, all students coming through, to understand that this is not stopping. Their learning experience is not stopping now. And I think that's a really critical thing. If we don't teach anything else to them, we're teaching them that when they leave us, we want them to continue to train within the organisation with another organisation, whatever it is. So creating those pathways, whether it's through us, to Cert 3, to Cert 4, to Diploma, going to a university, doing another qualification. Creating that depth and breadth of skills that we spoke about. Specifically though, in terms of Industry 4, and, and maybe I'm slightly skirting around it, but uh, you know, we, we've always traditionally had very strong networking um, qualifications within TAFE. We work with Cisco. That's how we do it. We couldn't do it on our own, so we work with Cisco and, and we do training. Um, cyber security, we've networked with a number of TAFEs across Australia to deliver the Cert 4 in cyber security. And we all recognise we need to work together so we can evolve and quickly establish the learning materials and content together so we can protect Australia. And another example of collaboration is facility for intelligent fabrication. I heard someone talk about welding. And in that, we're partnering with Weld Australia and the University of Wollongong in order to try and create a full stream from the traditional um, fabrication welding, trying to punch into um, international standards, making sure we're, we're keeping up to date with that, but also right through to robotic uh, welding and um, additive manufacturing. And another example of where we're trying to uh, grab something that's going really well and spreading it across the state is a little initiative that occurred in the Hunter, which is our STEM ship program with RDA Hunter. And that was grabbing students from school who were slightly disenfranchised with school but loved science. So how do we grab them and get them interested? So we worked with the defence companies, um, defence industries, and we put this, the school students, we took them out of school actually, put them into a TAFE program and gave them really good work placement in some of those partner companies, again, working in collaboration, making sure we're doing it how those industries wanted it, and working with them with the program. And those students, almost 70% of them then went on and took up apprenticeships. And they were effectively failing at school or, or almost becoming to the point they would drop out. So that was another really successful program. So if we can pick that up, we've created that pipeline into qualifications and giving them the exposure to those industries like everyone's talking about so they can actually see what they can actually do with their skills. So that's me. As I said, I sort of romped through it and hopefully I romped through it quick enough for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We're all back on schedule now. See, it's manufacturing, just in time. Um, I'd like now to introduce Melanie Sorensen. Um, Melanie's worked in the retail sector and has been in a small business as both an operator and an owner. She moved into the vocational education and training sector and has spent the last 20 years working across the WA VET sector in a variety of roles. After spending some years lecturing in ICT, she worked for the Department of Training as an e-learning and digital technology specialist and managed e-learning innovation and digital production, uh, production projects, both nationally and at state level. During this time, she led the e-learning implementation strategy for the TAFE sector in Western Australia and in recent years has held executive roles in organisational development strategy and development of organisational services. She holds a Bachelor of Education, Graduate Diploma in Multimedia Technology and a Master of Training and Development. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I think I'm one of those people in the last five years that was talked about earlier that uh, hopefully I won't be too controversial or say too much. If you know Perth, uh, I'm from South Metropolitan TAFE. Perth's divided by a river. You're either north or south, and I work in the south. 
We're a large college, probably around 1,200 staff, 22, 25,000 students, uh, from the sort of south of the River of Perth all the way down to the Peel. So a really large training organisation, over 15 campuses, just to put some perspective. Whoops. I guess this is showing my age a bit. That's not me um, in the photo. I guess printing was around for a really long time. Um, wooden blocks, ceramic blocks were well ar uh, around for hundreds of years before Gutenberg. Um, but it was really him who changed the printing. When I first started in TAFE in the early 90s, this was one of the first cohorts of people I trained were the, the typesetters who no longer had a job. Um, and it was moving very quickly through digital disruption. So there was job losses, jobs transformation, but importantly, jobs creation. And now I couldn't get by without our digital media specialists who manage Facebook on a daily occurrence for our students and industry. So it's, I think for me, it's an example that I've sort of lived through where some jobs died very, very quickly um, and I was teaching word processing and um, a whole range of ICT skills. But some have hung around for quite a while and new jobs have been created and I guess that's what this morning has been about. I would have predicted Facebook, unfortunately, um, or I wouldn't be here. But that is the type of technology or the type of jobs that we're not yet seeing, we don't yet know, but we're trying to get ready for. And I guess for us that's a real challenge as a training provider. How are we responding? Well, co-design, I guess, um, is something that we're working on, something we're trying to be better at. I think this morning it came up that it is messy. Things are messy. Um, we're working with industry partners to collaborate to try and work on digital disruption and automation um, and really trying to treat our, our students or the end users, potential end users, as equal partners and central to our design process. I wouldn't say we've got it right, we're on an early journey. And I think for us it's about recognising and acknowledging fast fail um, and, and being able to deal with that. We're not always going to get it right first time. Intentions for us is that Industry 4.0 is still emerging. We know that. It's been spoken about this morning. I guess it's also the rate, the depth and the breadth of the change that we are still working with and still struggling with, I would say, as a training provider. No different to what's been talked about today. And it's a highly evolving workplace. We know that. I think for us, confidentiality is a challenge. We work with industry partners. It's a very competitive environment out there. And it's also a competitive training environment, let me say, uh, as well, where we are all trying to compete for training. Um, so that's a challenge. That's a challenge. I think preparing our students for the employability skills needed for Industry 4.0. And I think balancing this with employer expectation is a challenge as well. Um, employers do need to support this and we've heard about that quite a lot this morning and what industry do, can do to support. So three things we've got on at the moment is, um, and we heard about a little bit about the test labs this morning, is at South Metropolitan TAFE we do have a, a oil and gas processing simulation plant. It's one of few in the world. And so collaboration with uh, UWA, looking at the feasibility of Industry 4.0 for the oil and gas technology industry. The digital shipyard, we have been involved with uh, partnerships with Defence recently um, and going forward we'll be in that space, in that world. Um, so I think some of the challenges around that, if I go back to oil and gas, is about our experience with applied research, not always strong in the TAFE sector, skills we're building, Sometimes it's just in time is just too late. It's about our speed of being able to implement that and I think the speed of curriculum development is a real challenge for us. In the digital shipyard, I guess, again, it's keeping our staff, our lecturers, upskilled. Um, it's, it's being able to provide that training, that industry experience for our lecturers. 
There's also a layer of industry quality and standards that sit on top of what we do. We are a highly regulated industry. We teach maritime oil and gas. We do nursing. We do um, aviation. We're used to the regulators on top of the standards for registered training organisations. But it is about another layer of industry expectation on the top of that for us. And that's some of the challenges we're dealing with at the moment. And I guess for us, to be honest, uh, the expense of infrastructure and equipment is a challenge as well. And I think it would be for most training organisations, that constant refresh and renewal. We have a partnership with Rio Tinto where we're looking at automation and uh, that's early stages kicking off. That will be around developing curriculum, working in partnership with Rio. It's a fantastic project that they're leading. That will be looking at those entry level, that initial education, some vet in schools as well as that sort of certificate two level entry. It is looking at skill sets, it is looking at micro accreditation for existing workers. And it's also looking about transitioning some workers into newly formed management roles and, and jobs. Again, the challenge is curriculum expertise. We don't have that in-house much anymore <laughs> with national training packages, and it's certainly not a criticism of national training packages. It's that we don't write that curriculum much anymore like we used to. So that's a challenge for us. And also the development of high-quality learning materials to support that. Again, um, that's, that can be challenging. So that's me. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just, um, leading on from what Tanya said and some of those other questions and the presentations this morning on those micro skills, and I'd direct this question at both of you. Um, the national curriculum, the national training packages we've got all set out at the moment. With the introduction of the Industry 4 skills, should they be embedded skills or are we better off to actually sit them separately in separate training packages that can be funded separately, that can be very agile and moved around? I know it's a bit controversial, that sort of thing, but how do you feel that would be best implemented as far as an institution is concerned? Um, yeah, so um, thanks for that. I, I guess I'm going to sound like I'm sitting on a fence here, but I would have said in actual fact we almost need to do both. Um, from my experience from, say, the lean manufacturing uh, package um, and competitive systems, um, it, there was a really great advantage of having something that was separate, that you could actually work with industry, and it only worked when you worked with industry, I would say, that training package, but you would work with them and you'd actually design a program to actually help them work through lean, work through those processes. And that was using people that actually already had a base qual and you were specifically doing that design. You, can then, you could then pull out small skill sets from that and then actually target it. However, at the same time, with our trades, as we started to teach that, we suddenly went, well, well what are we doing if we're actually, with our um, trades, we're allowing them to get up and go and leave a messy workshop at the end of the day. We're here we are over here teaching lean and lean principles and 5S and all these other things, and now we're actually allowing them to just get up and go because we'll have someone who comes up and cleans the TAFE workshop at the end. So that's not good either. So we need to embed those principles over here as well in our actual um, traditional trades qual. So they're getting the taster here, but it also actually, I think, is, is good to have the pack, um, some other way, a vehicle of, of training in this way. Oh, I'd hate to say ditto, but um, I think <laughs> partly that. I think, you know, the vet sector in Australia is, is well recognised and, and well respected, and I think training packages have a lot to do with that and the strength of training packages. I guess it's about that quickness to market and that flexibility that we also need. And that's not a criticism of training packages at all, but it's about uh, when an industry partner comes to us and asks for some training and they want that training to be accredited and recognised, how do we work with those small packages or micro credentials or skill sets? So I think it's probably a combination of both. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from the floor?
what's the, what is industry's um, desire for accreditation in this area? Is those those micro qualifications, those smaller snippets of learning that, that you said that your business model's adapted to, to starting to deliver, um, is that because it's been an industry, uh, a response to industry's needs that you've created those other opportunities, those other pathways for learning? Um, and do you feel that industry is asking for a qualification attached to it or is it that they just want the reskilling of their, 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 their staff? Where, where do you see that? Um, I think there was a comment that the, um, our manufacturing sector is extremely diverse and um, fractured in, in Australia, and I'd say that your aunt, the answer is going to be diverse and fractured because of that, because you'll get very different responses compared to the industries that you speak to. As I said, um, working with Asahi, with, with, with Tanya, you know, she was sa absolutely saying that she wants the training and it wants to be training fit for them, but if we can get credentials out of that, she absolutely wants them. So that's a, a big organisation and that's what I find with that. Small organisations, they're really the, the smaller ones, unfortunately they sometimes say they don't really care, but, um, and we can do the training, but if there is no national unit of competency or anything in which to base it upon, of course, then we have funding issues often from a government point of view. And for small manufacturers, that's hugely important because they can't afford the training otherwise. So yes, of course, we're a training organisation. We can go in and train whatever we want to train to customise it. But it, then we don't have that vehicle of funding behind it unless it's uh, some sort of accredited skill set. Yeah, pretty much the same. Can I um, reaffirm that elephant in the room, funding? You, the, I believe the company-based training system in Australia is beautifully set up to accommodate Industry 4 and any other changes. It can be very fast and nimble if the likes of IBSA and the industry work very quickly together. It's micro-credentials, that's what a unit of competency is, it's a micro-credential. The issue comes around who's going to pay. And most government levels aren't funding units or skill sets at the moment. Any industry partner can have any training they want of any RTO, I can guarantee that because we'll take your money. <laughs> but you've got to pay. You've got to pay full cost. If you want it at a tenth of the, your, the upfront cost, then you've got to conform to government regulations and rules around funding of a full qualification. And there's philosophical issues about the value of a full qualification, etc. But I think that's a big elephant in the room, if I may say so. Ian, do you want to no. <laughs> okay. Um, on the question of credentials, micro-credentials, both of the answers seem to me to be about what employers want. Yeah. Um, you sh the, the people who are your clients are your students. What do they want? Well, I, I guess that's part of the, um, what we've heard today as well, is that for many of our students coming in either and I, I guess this is part of TAFE's remit, is that you know, we are there to re-engage those who um, have either dropped out, haven't succeeded in their education, and so they would be looking for that first-time qualification and that pathway. Apprenticeships, traineeships, uh, you know, legislated certainly in the West, um, so um, they're a very different kettle of fish. I guess it's when there's some um, upskilling there's some currency issues around, um, you know, retraining for currency, um, which might be across many, many different industries. Students would look for micro-accreditation, or perhaps they're just adding a skill set. Um, they might just come in to do CAD or some other um, skill set like that. So, or around in nursing, it might be around, you know, medication, something like that. So I guess for our students, they, they also have a range of outcomes that they want to see from the training that they come in for. Predominantly with single subscriber students, they come in to gain a qualification and get a job. Yep, um, so we can say ditto a lot, can't we? <laughs> but but I'd, say, I'd say ditto on that. Um, the only thing I've ever, um, also experienced in terms of was actually training people in things like diplomas of engineering. So when we're going into someone who already has a qualification and a trade and they might enrol in a diploma, sometimes um, I know that for them, they have exited those diplomas before they have finished them because they've gained what they wanted to gain. So there is that 
that um, layer on top. But most definitely if it's their first qualification, they're wanting that qualification in order to actually secure themselves a job. Thank you. Just uh, on that then, and we heard about it, we've heard about it um, several times this afternoon as well, the ability for manufacturing as a whole to attract and retain skills and jobs, especially with young people coming in, because we've seen that the requirements are higher, the need for highly motivated young people, and we've got to compete against a lot of other industry areas. How do we do that from a training and education perspective? Yep. So, so um, I think I think there's there's two things um, with 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 an RTO, and this is what we're we're looking at our courses and reforming them at the moment. But to try and make them more exciting up front, you know, let's face it. The as I said, I, I throw this in the air a lot, but there are some teachers out there who go, "Whoop, not allowed to use your phone. Put your phone away," and and that will it will come over here. But the, the phone is the reality of often of how things are searched and looked for. Um, the apps that are used, um, we heard that in industry, so we need to embed the phone more in the learning and hopefully then engage and continue with that. However, also manufacturers need to understand that um, we sometimes find with our apprentices that they, they start and then what we're hearing from our apprentices is that they're spending six months of their time strapping or six months of their time doing something fairly low skilled and aren't being given those opportunities so we're not engaging them and often we therefore the the industry also loses them because they're not seeing and using the potential of that student up front and pushing that person because they want to be challenged the only thing i could add to that as well is that there's sometimes a tension between um, industry's training expectations and what we have to deliver under national curriculum and the training package. So sometimes, and that's not a criticism again of the training package, it's just that we, the, we would be giving a broad-based education to that apprentice um, or to that uh, uh, person undertaking the training. So sometimes I think industry expects us to focus on one or two or three components of what they want, but actually we're training that person for a broader a broader occupational outcome. So I think sometimes we probably don't sell the product that, we d that we're um, delivering as well as we could to industry. Taking that one step further then, and given the fact that you know, just by those rough numbers we had before, we're looking at 100,000 new jobs, as a lot of the people of my age group leaving the workforce, how's TAFE's position for actually internal skills to be able to cope with these changes of requirements plus the increase in numbers, which is a concern. Um, so, so, so two ways. I guess um, the uh, our partnership with industry, again, I'm, I'm probably looking at Tanya as well with this, but with um, the industry four that she's going through, part of the engagement was to upskill our staff as well. So that anything that was actually occurring at Asahi, as Swinburne also came in um, and, and did their part of it, was that understanding that we would lift uh, the New South Wales capability in that area. So that was, that was part of the way we were doing it. Um, and on the other side, um, we've recently had um, a, a very big industry drive to try and um, get more part-time teachers uh, into TAFE to try and maybe get some of those exiting people who are very digitally aware to come back into TAFE to actually become teachers and, and pass that knowledge on because that's a really important part as well. I think that's a great challenge, <laughs> can I say? Uh, return to industry for our current lecturers is really, really important and our, so our industry partners are criti critical in that and I think we do quite well in that. But to be employed as a TAFE lecturer, certainly in the West, um, you have to have five years industry experience and qualifications in that industry, at least to the level that you're teaching. That's in the standards for registered training organisations. You don't have to be a teacher to teach. And once you get the job, then we spend a lot of time training you how to be really good at teaching. So it's, it's I can see people nodding. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. It's, it's a real balancing act. The longer you spend in TAFE, I can use myself as an example, the better teacher I am, the less industry current I am. So the return to industry as I grow my teaching skills over time becomes absolutely critical. So it's a bit like this seesaw that we have. 
We've got fabulous industry partners who um, really support us in having our lecturers go back into industry and work for you know, a day a week, two weeks at a time. And that's absolutely critical to keep us upskilled. We'll start, because you, you've yeah, come back to the second question. <laughs> Do you want to, just a very quick comment on that, both of you? Oh, God. Um, well, yeah, I, I'm, I certainly you know, embrace that things are changing. Um, and, and you're right in terms of, you know, are we being provocative enough? Um, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot there. When I'm worried at home, my husband always says to me, Karen, the reason why you're worried is there's not an easy solution here. Otherwise, why would you be going to a conference in Melbourne to be talking about it? Because if there was an easy solution, we wouldn't be talking about it. We'd be just going out there doing it. So um, yes, lots of challenges, but I'm also one person to say that we can't just stand there and do nothing as well while we think about what it is that we should be doing. So we're doing something. We're both doing things. If we fail, we fail. Um, but uh, yeah, it should be challenging ourselves more. I think we do need to every day. Absolutely, and I totally agree with what you're saying, in as much as that it is changing, but a lot of the fundamental jobs are still the same. Employers still need a skill or a qualification. I don't want a Sparky who's really innovative and different coming in and wiring my house. It's a mix of both. But I do want that Sparky to be have the latest technology, to be able to actually have the latest safety equipment, to be able to buy online, not to have to drive up and buy a part that he didn't bring with him. He needs to be fully digital and he needs to be with it. He needs to have a degree of mechatronics. The fitters we need in industry are also, they need to be able to be far more innovative than they were when I did my apprenticeship. It's changed. The disruption is there, and Tanya pointed that out, but equally, the fitter that's going to go and fix that line needs to have a lot of that data that's there. But he wants to do it in a safe environment not in a panic mode. He needs to be digitally aware that it's prevented, that from a preventative maintenance perspective, that's going to break down in four days' time, and I'll do it at the best time. So it is a mixture, but you're right, being able to actually cope with that. We need to change the mindset of young people in year nine, year eight, to get them on this journey, because it's too late in year 12. They've made their career decisions. One, one more. Oh, two more because I can't, <laughs> sorry. Hi, Michelle. I would like to come back to the question of industry wants to have people with skills, maybe not with all the 10 skills which the system wants, but only with five. And the, the students might want to have more skills so they have a qualification, but the employer doesn't want to pay for more. So the question is how can we do something at the money side to make it for all parties interesting to make things happen? Because if we don't do that, 
then you will never reach the goal. So there must be an incentive for the student, for the employer, and for the system still to get that full accreditation passed on. And maybe one could look in future at doing that over time instead of doing it all in one year or one half year, but doing it over time. Okay. So that you still get a full qualification, but not at the time that the industry needs a person or wants to have a, a person with a few skills. Jen, do you want to just touch on that one? And then we'll get... Yeah, um, I, I think what was, what, what was um, discussed was an actual fact <coughs> where you've got a situation, you might have a three-year apprenticeship, um, and the, the first year, say, comes in and he, um, he or she might be doing some skills that the employer goes, well, why aren't you jumping into CNC machining? Because that's what I wanted. Um, but we were talking about the restriction of, in some ways, restriction of the training package to say, well, actually, we need to teach these things first because there's prerequisites and sequential and there's packaging arrangements. But I think the strong point is, is that um, part of that is that that person's not going to work there always. Yeah. So they need those skills to be able to move to another role as well. So we have to teach them that full suite. Yeah. Oh, you got it. Thank you. Yeah. Lastly, Peter, Peter spot on. Uh, sustainability IRC. Um, but just we heard today a little bit about uh, Industry 4.0 and how we can change training and embrace technology within uh, the workplace. But then we've also got the other side to it, which is the employers, and there's a lot of employers out there who, who train people so that they can say they've trained people and they've got a qualification, but don't necessarily use that training. What's being done to actually demonstrate to employers the value of the training and how to reap the benefit of that training? Do you want to just have a... Sorry, I'm not quite sure I understand your question, the value of the training. Quite simply, employers out there who train yep. people because they like to have people trained, but don't understand the value of training. So it's fine if you've got a stupid board of apprentices yep. and apprentices, but how do we then ensure that the employers use those skills within the workplace? I guess that's the employer choice, though, isn't it? Well, it's not really, because... Part Are of you... T are you meaning apprenticeship? No. no. Yeah. We go through and do that. So, uh, and plant organisations do that. So, they have a, a proactive scheme to train people. But when you have a look at the scratch the surface, they're not actually putting in programs that people can use that training mm. within the workplace. So, the, work, the employer is taking the government funding and giving yeah. training for nothing, but they're not actually using the skills of the people in training. Mm. Well, I think the world is littered with RTOs <laughs> that have screwed the system, and it'll always happen. In the future, these won't be there. They will become, they'll actually, no, I'm talking about the employers. They'll actually be run over, because if they don't understand the value of training in their workforce, they won't be there in five years. Yep. I think it's part of that whole picture that we speak about on the bits that Yen's put up there, on what are the characteristics of a high-performing company that compete on value, not on cost, the whole lot of it. It's a huge question, and I think we'd need another three hours to answer it, but it's a very valid one, because yes, we do spend a lot of taxpayers' dollars on training that isn't actually worthwhile. So on that note, I'd like to thank the panellists and pass it back to Peter. Thank you.